Hi there, so welcome to Tynesfield today, which is this absolutely stunning Victorian Gothic manor house and estate that you can see behind me. So this property was owned by a William Gibb who actually made his money from guano, which was chicken dung used as fertilizer. And that allowed him, the money he made from that allowed him to extend what was previously a much smaller house into this absolutely gorgeous Victorian gothic revival mansion manor house <laughs> and uh, his further three generations continue to add and build to this property to make it what it is today so we're going to go take a look around uh, i actually filmed the outside of this at the end of summer and then i came back <laughs> today to do the bits that i couldn't do before which was inside so excuse the fact that we scoot between the end of summer and uh, halloween <laughs> but uh, hopefully you can bear with me on that and it's rained both times both times i've come here it's had true gothic weather or British weather as we might say unfortunately in England you can't stop because it rains or she'd never do anything so let's go and take a look believe it or not this was the footage that I took in October rather than at the end of summer we've had some really nice sunny days even if they've been a little bit colder and uh, it's really nice with all this beautiful red foliage covering the outside. I am going to show you a few of the video clips from summer as well, just so you can see how the flowers are in the garden. So how did somebody get rich enough to build this incredible property? Well, actually it was from selling bird dung, which was called guano. And there's a little Victorian ditty that says, William Gibbs made his dip selling the turds of foreign birds. And I'll go a little bit more into this story, but it's always these people with these boring jobs that really seem to have all the money. Because I used to work in promotions and I used to go to a lot of these events with incredibly rich people. And they always had jobs like tea cake maker, toilet roll factory, chicken farmer. I never saw glamorous jobs at any of these events. So William's father was actually very up and down when it came to money and he really lacked business acumen and he ended up going bankrupt in 1789. So William's path to making all this money came through the business Anthony Gibbs and Son, which was founded in 1808 by Anthony and his eldest son, George. William joined the partnership in 1813 and they officially added a plural to Son to make it Sons. Just two years later, when their father died, they became the sole owners of the business and they vowed to repay all the outstanding debts of their father and grandfather, since both had been made bankrupt. They achieved this objective by 1840, but unfortunately Henry died in 1942, leaving William to carry on the business all by himself. So although guano was well known locally as an effective fertilizer, due to its richness in nitrogen and phosphate, it soon became accepted over in the West. In 1847, A. Gibson Sons had secured a monopoly for the British guano trade and at the height of their operation they earned 100,000 a year. Now that would be £8 million in today's money. So now we can see how they got the money for this absolutely gorgeous estate. So William finally did get married before he'd been pining over a maiden in Spain, but unfortunately the union didn't work out due to religion, which was a much bigger thing at the time than it is now. He finally married in 1839 a lady called Matilda. She was also known as Blanche. And rather shockingly, by today's standard, she was 21 when he was 49. So in need of a country home nearer to the family, in 1843, he bought Tynesfield. Although it wasn't a tiny property, it was much, much smaller than what you see today and he proceeded to rebuild and enlarge this property, a project that was not completed until 1865. And it was actually continued by at least three generations of the family as well to continually build and expand this property into what we see today. Now, please excuse my video inside. This property was very, very dark and I just couldn't get good footage. So in some places, I'm actually going to use photos. So a little fact is that no National Trust place has a bigger collection of objects than Tynesfield. So we just came out of the main entrance hall, which was called the Grand Hall. And as always in these time periods, it was the focal point of the house. 
and this amazing fireplace here was actually carved from Mansfield sandstone. The fireplace sets out the Gibbs family's values in stone. The statues depicting the four cardinal virtues, fortitude, temperance, justice and prudence and there's even a fifth virtue of truth. So we did go past the library already and the library was the first room that you walk into when you enter the house. And this is no accident. Its prominence reflects its importance to the Gibbs family. It wasn't a place where their books would gather dust and never be read. Instead, it was a well-loved repository of knowledge, self-improvement and amusement in a period where they didn't have televisions. There's 3,000 books in this library, however, they make up just a fraction of the Tynesfield book collection. In total, there are around 10,000 in the house, and it's one of the largest book collections in the National Trust. So this painting is one of the most famous artefacts in this house. It's a 15th century painting by Giovanni Bellini and it's the Madonna and Child with St John the Baptist. It was purchased in 1880 by the Gibbs family. It did have to be removed for a while until the house could provide the exact conditions that were necessary to keep this painting intact. So this room is full of stuff that they moved out of the room that you saw that was empty earlier and you can just see how much stuff is in this house. So here is the reception room where guests were welcomed and entertained and you'll see there's lots of games that were around at the time, particularly the cards. So in these paintings in the corridor, you will see what the house looked like when it was first built. Very different from today, as you'll see, there's also a photograph at the top. And I love this old issue of Country Life, which featured Tynesfield at the time. It's amazing how long this magazine has been in circulation actually because I remember doing my work experience at Country Life so it's incredible to see that it went this far back in time. So this was Mrs Gibbs' room, the boudoir, and it was one of the original parts of the 1820s house, but it was redesigned by architect John Norton for Matilda or Blanche Gibbs when the family brought the house. This wood panelling that you can see around the side was intricately carved with roses, strawberries and pineapples. I love this golden chest, it was probably one of my favourite items of furniture in the house, just on a personal level. Now we come on to one of my favourite rooms in the house. It might not be as elaborate as the rest, but it's a very, very interesting room and the lady on the room was just so knowledgeable and happy to chat that I always think that makes a room more interesting. So the moose you can see here, and I don't even eat animals, so it's a bit difficult to see, but you kind of have to get rid of that when you come to these old houses. But this moose here was actually shot by one of the wives in the house, which really surprised me to hear. It was actually shot by George Abraham's first wife. So it was mostly the men that came in this room and the billiard table was their pride and joy. It was actually heated just to ensure that the balls ran smoothly. It also had these incredible carvings around the edge, which were all different kinds of sports at the time. We were trying to guess what the sports were. I'm not sure if any of you can tell me what this sport was. Maybe we can have an open competition. This one was archery. Not sure about the first one, but the second one we believe, and maybe this one too, was where they release birds of prey to go and catch smaller birds for them. I swear this final one looks like an egg and spoon race, but I'm pretty sure that it can't be, but it really does look like one. <laughs> So this was an electronic, very state-of-the-art for the time scoring system and there were all these buttons around the pool table and you press them. I don't exactly know how it works but it was very fancy. So unfortunately when I was there the upstairs was closed so it was straight into the kitchen pantry areas which 
were very worn they were very much not opulent and i guess that's because all the food was made by these servants at the time it wasn't as much fun being a servant back in those days and this also leads me to talk a little bit about the guano extraction process which was an incredibly dangerous occupation and the living conditions were very poor and most of the extraction was performed by Chinese laborers who worked in slavery-like conditions and were economically bound to earn back their transport, board and lodging costs before they could even make a profit. Before slavery was outlawed in Peru in 1854, guano was also extracted by some enslaved people as well as convicts, conscripts and army deserters. It does have to be noticed though that during Gibson's son's business, they actually improved the workers' conditions medical care and the pay. This was in part due to the fact that there was a lot of external observers now looking at the business and they pushed for fairer conditions for the workers. So the chapel is probably one of my favourite chapels on a National Trust property. Almost all these houses seem to come with their own chapel. It was obviously a very important part of daily life was the worship. This chapel was commissioned in 1873 by William and he commissioned Arthur Bloomfield who remodelled on the flamboyant Gothic architecture of the Saint Chapelle in Paris. It was nearly complete in 1875, which was just before William's death. The chapel was licensed for family services and used for daily prayers, but it was never consecrated, so anybody from outside was unable to come here for worship. So here are the memorial crosses for Anthony and his wife Janet. So the lady in the chapel was also super helpful and knowledgeable and she pointed out to me that this orange barge, you see it's at the bottom on the right stained glass window and it's one line up on the left one. Well, it was designed on purpose to be like this because it represents how man can make mistakes but God never does. So here are the memorial crosses for William and his wife Matilda. So this white cross on the far left is actually from the relative who was the last to die and they are going to pop that plaque on soon. So we're over in the gardens now. We've got the kitchen's garden, we've got the conservatory, and we've got the orangery, which is normally a cafe, but it was closed, unfortunately, when I was there. I was hoping to go there for my drink. So they had these conservatories. In this one, there was lemons, and probably the most beautiful plant that I've ever seen that not only looked gorgeous, but smelled divine. So I've never seen this plant before, but it's known as a variety of names from the corkscrew vine to the snail flower. And it's a fast growing vine that just honestly smells absolutely divine. It's actually such a fast grower that in the right conditions, it can actually take over the rest of your backyard or garden and is considered invasive. These smell so amazing. I just can't believe how nice they smell. So the formal gardens at the front of the building, which I showed earlier on in the video, were first created in 1850 and they were gradually improved by each member of the Gibbs family. And today the planting is very much as it was in the early 1900s when, the, when Tynesfield was owned by Anthony Gibbs. Believe it or not, there's 10,000 flowers there during the summer months. Mm -hmm. 
So here's the orangery and the cut flower garden. So actually when the National Trust first began caring for this property in 2002, the orangery was virtually derelict with several stone columns missing and serious damage to the roof. So they've had to put a lot of time and money into restoration work to bring it back to its former glory. The flowers in this garden would have been used by the Gibbs family and today the volunteers create arrangements in the house from these same flowers. Although it was closed, they did have this incredible pumpkin harvest display, but unfortunately the door was closed, so I couldn't get in and actually film it. So here we are at the kitchen garden. They have this small greenhouse there and then a huge garden, which still had so much produce in it. The produce in this garden looks incredible. So apparently they ship it out to a local restaurant. So the piece de resistance in this garden is definitely these amazing dahlias. So stunning. Here we have some artichokes, which are one of my favorites. So apparently they have a table out sometimes where they put spare produce on for donation, but there was definitely no produce when I was there or I missed the table, one of the two. So here we have the rose garden. The Rose Garden is a real gem hidden away and very tranquil and peaceful. When the National Trust took it on, the gazebos were really in a bad state of disrepair and they even replaced some of the Victorian tiles that had been missing or broken. The project to restore this garden actually took four years. The garden actually includes over a hundred highly scented roses. And since I visited twice, it wouldn't be right for me not to include this video with all the roses out at the end of summer. So the main cafe is in this old barn, which is really cool actually, I love it. And then of course they have the National Trust shop. This one I would say is actually a really big one and it was decked out with Halloween and autumn stuff. And then they had a Christmas section as well, which was quite fun. A real standout thing about Tynesfield as well is all the topiary. There's a lot and they all were freshly done I think when I went. They look very neat and uh, really add to the property. And a bit of a random shot for the end but I absolutely love this tree. Stunning. I think it's a type of magnolia.